First of all, I want to welcome all of you to come to today's lecture. We'll get started in a minute, but we want to begin with a prayer, and this will be led by uh, one of our graduates, Ryan Pernada. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, as we gather here tonight, we acknowledge your presence. We are thankful for the opportunity to be with one another, to honor a colleague, and to learn from each other. As we reflect on our past, grant that we learn from our shortcomings. As we contemplate the present, help us to appreciate our gifts and talents. And as we look forward to the future, may we always realize that without you, we cannot do anything. You are the source of all knowledge, and as students, educators, librarians, and information specialists, we are just instruments. May we continue to be messengers of the truth, and may we be of service to our fellow brothers and sisters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. President Gavi, distinguished guests, faculty, alumni, students, staff, and friends, uh, good evening and welcome to the 22nd Elizabeth Stone Lecture of the School of Library and Information Science. We are deeply honored today that President Gavi is able to join us. Uh, I will say a few words about SLIS and the event tonight, and then I will invite Dr. Uh, President Gavi to speak to us. This year, as you know, we celebrate 100 years of our endeavor in library education and 30 years as a school. It all started in 1911, when a number of the librarians from DC Public Library started offering courses in the summer at the, school, at the Catholic University of America. In 1981, we became a school because of the vision of Dr. Elizabeth Stone. And since then, we have uh, dedicated ourselves to the development of leaders with strong professional ethics and a commitment to a more just and compassionate society. 30 years later, our curriculum has evolved dramatically to address the changing needs of the society. We offer religious institutes and digital collection courses to help Catholic organizations manage and provide access to their uh, records and artifacts. And one of the very exciting news and new development this particular year is that we are taking our students to Rome. And uh, we will have our students there to study the Vatican libraries and archives and see how they are using digital technology to promote research on the teachings of the church and to promote appreciation and understanding of the work of the church. We have made a lot of progress at SLUS, and many of those progress are documented in the book that you have that we created to celebrate our uh, anniversaries. Over the years, many of our graduates have become movers and shakers in public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries, federal libraries, and other special types of libraries. In addition, our graduates work in dioceses, religious houses, archives, federal agencies, news media, and other information intensive environments. If you take a look around you and look at the, the neighbors, uh, you will agree that we have produced many, many strong leaders and many of them uh, have made significant contribution to the field of library and information science. And together, we have made pro uh, much progress in advancing knowledge, providing service, and extending discovery uh, for the nation and the world. This year, we, have, uh, we began celebrating our anniversaries uh, through a whole series of events last fall. Dr. Carla Hayden kicked off the celebration last September with a talk on challenges and opportunities for public libraries. And that was followed by a panel of luminaries, uh, the top leaders of the field, in October. And that included Anne Caputo, Maureen Sullivan, who is now the incoming president of ALA. We also had Susan Hildreth. She is the uh, director of IMLS. And they talk about the future and opportunities for the field. In addition, last November, we had uh, Mr. David Ferriero, the archivist of the United States, coming to our school to talk to us about the National Archives and their endeavors, as well as the importance of records management for the nation. And then in February, we have Mr. Roberta Schaefer, 
the Associate Librarian of the Library of Congress, coming to us to talk about LC's effort to engage the community and make its rich resources available to the general public. And by the way, Ms. Schaefer is one of the uh, longtime uh, supporters of our school, and she even taught at our school. And she, it's because of her effort in reinvigorating our law librarianship that we now hold the number two position uh, in terms of ranking uh, in the nation. So thank you, Roberta. Uh, and now, uh, as uh, we go through all these wonderful presentations, finally we come to tonight. And tonight, we are having Dr. Deanna Markham to really uh, bring us to the conclusion of this year-long celebration. Dr. Markham is quite knowledgeable and highly respected in the field. And tonight, she's going to talk to us about digital le leadership. I know we are in for a treat. So um, uh, in a few minutes, uh, we will have an introduction of Dr. Markham and begin the, uh, the speech by her. But before that, I want to say, I want to invite uh, President Gavi to the podium. We are deeply grateful that President Gavi joined us tonight. President Gavi became the, pre the 15th president of CUA in June 2010. Since his first year, he has encouraged the CUA community to examine the connection between intellect and virtue. What resonates most for me is his view that at the university, we not only convey knowledge, but also help with the development of a whole person. President Gavi is a th careful thinker and has a lot to share with us. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming him, uh, in welcoming him to this podium. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and thanks to all of you for um, coming tonight. It's an honor for us to be joined by so many uh, distinguished and interested guests from the field of library and information science. I want especially to welcome Dr. Deanna Markham, who's um, uh, tonight's um, lecturer, and to congratulate the School of Library and Information Sciences on 100 years of educating library and information professionals here at the Catholic University. This is the 22nd uh, annual um, Elizabeth Stone Lecture, and Dr. Stone, for those of you who didn't know her, died 10 years ago and was a, was a famous figure in the field of library science. We remember, here at, remember her here at Catholic University as one of our distinguished alumni. She was dean of the School of Library and Information Science from, from 81 to 83. She served as president of the Washington chapter of the Special Library Association for, uh, for a period and as president of the American Library Association from 1981 to 82 and was a tireless <coughs> worker in the field that tonight's attendees are all working in. Um, last fall, as Ingrid mentioned, in celebration of our centennial here, we hosted a panel of the field's um, luminaries and they had a, a fascinating discussion about the new challenges in the, in the field that you all experience as well as the, some of the exciting possibilities that technological change has brought about um, when Benjamin Franklin and a group of his friends established the first lending library in the United States in 1731, it was um, a very different world where uh, the library professionals were concerned with the, the, the pool of resources and the cultural community that he and his friends formed served, served the purpose of increasing access to information. There weren't many books in those days. If somebody had a library that was this big, it was a big deal and people shared them with one another and having a book or just having access to a book was a precious thing. Today in some ways we have uh, almost the opposite problem. We have sometimes, um, uh, there are people who still lack access to information, but sometimes today we feel as though we have too much of it. Uh, um, information about anything is just a Google search away. During dinner I was talking um, with Carla uh, Hayden about how in my class in, in um, constitutional law that I was teaching one, one year at the law school where I used to work, I, I began a sentence by, se uh, where I was teaching a case National League of Cities about, about the regulation of the hours of police and firefighters and I said, I don't know how many policemen there are in the United States, but, and somebody said, 53,289. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it just like that. It's just a Google search away, and journals and publications that used to spend weeks in transit between the publisher and the, and the reader are now available online, and even when we don't go looking for it, it shows up in our inboxes on Facebook or 
Twitter accounts or, or um, instant updates of one kind or another. But this kind of greater access to information comes with cost as well as benefit. The problem for us nowadays is to make the information that's good and useful available and filter out the bad information that, that gets in the way or, d or is distracting. And coming up with, with useful, effective, and innovative ways of doing that is one of the challenges that professionals face nowadays. One of the points made during this um, event that we held last fall by the, the president-elect, Maureen Sullivan, during the discussion has stuck with me. She said that libraries have always been an integral part of the, of the communities that they represent. And uh, like a university, a library reminds the community that learning really matters, that it's a really important thing, that um, the face of library and information science has changed a lot in the in the half century since Elizabeth Stone received her degree, and it's changed way more than that in the 280 or so years since Benjamin Franklin started the library company. But I think the core belief in what libraries represent to us, the value of learning, is something that endures throughout this. So um, before we hear from Dr. Markham, I'd, I'd like to say uh, just one more word about, uh, about another of our professors. Matilda Robostad was a professor of library science at Catholic University for 30 years. She received her Master of Library Science here in 1960 after immigrating to the country from Germany. And for three decades, she taught courses in international librarianship, a subject with which she was by nature um, and upbringing um, prepared to be well acquainted. In 2004, the year her husband Howard died, the Rolstads gave us a substantial gift to support academically qualified students in library and information science. And when Dr. Rolstad died in herself in 2010, she left us a bequest directed to the already established scholarship. And today the fund has a balance of $1.4 million. And we use the earnings to pay tuition for our best students here at, uh, here at the school. So. Um, with us here tonight is Lisa Sway, who is Matilda and Howard's daughter, come all the way from Seattle, Washington for this event. So I'd like to call her up just for a minute to receive this token of her, our appreciation for everything that her family has done for us here. So this is the Catholic University, the Catholic University of America honors Matilda and Howard Robelstead, Lisa Sway, in recognition of your outstanding support for the School of Library and Information Science in 2012. Good evening, everyone. Um, the Raymond Von Dran Award uh, was given annually to a dist distinguished alum of the CUA School of Library and Information Science. Uh, it was instituted in memory of Raymond Von Dran, who was the second dean of Library and Information Science at Catholic University, uh, following uh, Elizabeth Stone from 1983 to 1987. Uh, Von Dran was a leading figure in library science and in reinventing the tr traditional library into uh, what are known as iSchools. And um, his focus of his attention was, um, uh, forgive me, <laughs> the focus of his uh, attention was on the pervasive influence of information science in contemporary life. Uh, it said of him that he was truly a dean among deans, a natural leader who inspired others to use their talents and energies to improve the world. Uh, the award this year will go to a uh, SLIS alumnus who through his uh, contributions and profession, uh, professionalism has exhibited qualities that Von Dran himself uh, was noted for throughout his career, innovation, collaboration, and leadership. It gives me great pleasure this year to award the 2012 edition of the uh, Von Dran Award to James Patrick Timoney. Won't you come up? I'd like to say a few things about you. <laughs> uh, 
Patrick is the um, Adaptive Services Librarian at the DC Public Library. He is, uh, the f this is the first time in a number of years that the uh, Raymond Von Dran Award has gone to a public library librarian and we're all very impressed with the work that he's done and uh, we're inspired by his good work. I'm gonna hand you this right now. Um, in addition to his early career work uh, at the MIT Electronic Research Society Hackerspace and the MIT Media Lab Startup, his uh, academic credentials are from Franklin and Marshall College, Catholic University SLIS, and an Adaptive Technology Certificate from Cal State Northridge. Uh, Patrick works one-on-one um, -on -one with library users who are blind, have cognitive issues, dexterity issues, low vision, aphasia, difficulty vocalizing, and hearing loss. He works with those who have intellectual disabilities, including autism, to develop accommodations and learn how innovation occurs in this environment. His program makes important adaptive technologies available to the public through the DC Public Library Adaptive Services Unit, which also provides free adaptive technology training and events for users and professionals. Uh, uh, Patrick works to provide free, refurbished computers with adaptive software, employment training with funding, and also a calendar that is a model for libraries worldwide. You want to speak with Patrick about his interest in mobile gestural device accessibility, remote participation, telephone system access to information, adaptive sports and recreation innovation, and business incubation. Patrick is in an ongoing collaboration with the FCC to develop library services solutions initiated at, at accessibility hackathon-like events um, involving multiple organizations nationwide uh, with much of the work planned in the DC Public Library. Uh, Patrick works with the DC Public Schools and multiple organizations and agencies around the area to sponsor monthly meetups, outreach and health programs, leadership training for teens with disabilities, and employment training events. Uh, Patrick also performs accessibility testing in collaboration with the Syracuse High School where Raymond Von Dran, for whom this award was, uh, is named, uh, was dean until uh, the time of his untimely death. Uh, uh, James Patrick Timoney has built and is building an adaptive technology program at the DC Public Library, which exemplifies innovation and collaboration and leadership. We wish him good luck and Godspeed in his efforts at doing the good work of adaptive services in public libraries. Congratulations, Patrick. I believe Patrick has a few words about the Adaptive Services Unit. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everyone. I just have a couple of things to say. Um, I want to let everyone know how much I appreciate getting this award and also how I appreciate the opportunity to get the word out about what we're doing at the DC Public Library and um, that this is an opportunity also to recognize the community that uh, all of these programs happen in and how that's where innovation happens. Now, uh, I would have changed one thing that you said, which is that this, it really, it's not just innovation in this community, that it's, that that's what innovation is, is, uh, or innovation comes out of the struggle for access in a situation where there are barriers. And my community knows what barriers are, and they also, I think, more fundamentally know what innovation is. Um, and so that's one of the most important points or things that comes out of our community is innovation. So I think that tonight is an opportunity to, for uh, a diverse group of people, like the alumni of, uh, of the uh, School of Library and Information Science, to get together and talk about um, these two important things, which are diversity and innovation. And um, the two points that I wanna make are two things that are going on at our library. One is, has to do with training, and the other has to do with uh, programming. And so two of the things that I do. Um, Chris Corrigan, who is uh, our adaptive technology trainer and who is in school right now at Catholic University, um, is our trainer. He teaches people how to use JAWS, which is the screen reader voice that gives you access to uh, the computer if you were blind. And um, he has uh, come up with, suggested a, um, s a class at, at the DC Public Library that could combine students from Catholic and also students from the University of Maryland who we are already working with to a degree, um, to teach them about web accessibility um, and how to make web pages accessible that aren't accessible and how to build accessible web pages, which I think is a great idea. So I think that's one um, potential for a program at the library that could then be modeled other places. 
Um, the other point to, uh, to talk about is something that's happening at the library, uh, the Martin Luther King Library this summer, which is a sort of a meetup of meetups where all of the tech meetups from around DC, for instance, Python programmers or people who program computers are going to be getting together on a regular basis, on a weekly basis at the MLK Library for free to them where they usually have to pay for the space. It's an incredibly accessible space because it's at Metro Center. Um, these tech meetups are all very knowledgeable people and they know how to build things. And um, Raymond Von Dran's uh, program at Syracuse was about innovation, getting people in, in uh, libraries to come up with ideas and then to build them. And so this group of people is, very, is great at building things. Um, we've got a lot of needs in our community or requirements. And if uh, I think that the library schools could get involved there, that there's a, a great potential for um, success. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Fultz. I'm the president of the SLIS Alumni Board. And I just, on behalf of the board and of SLIS, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, beyond that, I don't think anyone is particularly interested in hearing me talk. So I'm just going to welcome Deanna Markham up to uh, for her presentation. She was a former Dean of SLIS and has always been a friend of the school and we're thrilled to have her here to speak to us tonight. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sound okay in the back? Okay, good. Um, I really appreciate seeing a crowd on a Friday evening. Um, there are many things you could be doing tonight other than listening to a lecture on digital leadership, but um, I'm delighted you're here and I'm very pleased uh, to be taking part in the school's uh, centennial celebration. I very much appreciate Ingrid's invitation to be the Stone Lecturer tonight and uh, really admire what she has done to make the school more visible Thank you. Um, during this centennial year. I think that has been extremely helpful. And I'd also like to thank you, President Garvey, for your support of the school and uh, the work that the school is trying to do. It means a great deal to all of us to know that uh, the program that has been so important to the library community for so many years uh, is, is continuing to be supported. And on a, a very personal level, I'm so pleased to have had a little part in this school's history. I'm very proud of what we did when I was here. Well, being invited uh, to give the Stone Lecture gives one license to focus on a topic that means a lot to him or her. So I've taken uh, this opportunity to talk about leadership in the digital era. I consider this topic uh, so important because libraries are changing so dramatically. Um, President Garvey talked about the differences between the library Benjamin Franklin created and what we have now. Uh, it's almost incomprehensible, uh, the changes that have occurred. And so I spend a lot of time thinking personally about what kinds of leaders we're going to need to be successful in the digital era, just as we've been successful in the print era. And as I say the words um, of leadership development or uh, digital leadership, I'm reminded of the leadership provided by Elizabeth Stone for so many years of the school. Some of you in this room were fortunate enough to know her, and anyone who knew her remembers that she was a force of nature. There's no other description of her. Um, if Betty asked you to do something, you did not take that as a request, you took that as a demand. <laughs> and she made things happen. She loved this school as she loved members of her family. 
And I'm also reminded of my dear and also now departed friend, Matilda Rovelsat. Though different in so many ways, and in, in many ways you can't imagine two women more different, I believe the sheer willpower of these two women, one is the dean and one is the most rigorous faculty member, kept the school alive through its dark and its bright days. I'm sorry that Ann Stone Crow, um, Betty's daughter, is unable to be here tonight. She's such a friend of the school and such a stalwart supporter. But she's at, a, um, at the Kennedy Center in a performance tonight and can't be here, but she certainly sends her best wishes to the school. And I also want to acknowledge Lisa Sway, uh, who has come from Seattle to be with us, to both of these daughters. Uh, they've played such an important role in keeping these flames alive, and we're grateful to you. So Betty Stone and Matilda Robelstadt were towering figures in their day, which was certainly a pre-digital era. I suppose Betty used a computer at the end of her career, although I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I, I suppose she did. Um, Matilda tried to learn to use a computer after she retired, but I think her language got a little rough when she was describing this thing over here uh, that <laughs> proved to be a great source of annoyance. And she returned to her beloved typewriter to write her papers and to write letters. But each of these women, in an entirely different and individual way, was very much focused on leadership for the profession. So I'm going to try to channel them tonight and think with you about what our leaders in the digital era must model for the next generation. And I suppose the first question is an obvious one. Is digital leadership any different from any other kind of leadership? What's special about digital leadership? Well, I started thinking about this because I believe that this era is so different. The, the way we receive communication, the way we send communication, the way we think about our organizations is so fundamentally different that I decided to consult the management literature to see what management specialists have to say, if anything, about digital leadership. And I hope they can help me understand uh, just what is required. And what became clear is that different eras have produced very different kinds of leadership with different patterns of hierarchical authority, different skill sets and attitudes, and different views on roles and responsibilities of institutions. In this transitional period in which we live, we are experiencing significant changes potentially as far-reaching as the transition from agricultural to industrial societies. We are in the early stages of a transition uh, to a post-industrial society, a digital society, and leadership patterns and indeed the institutions we know best are beginning to reflect that transition. James McGregor Burns, a renowned management expert, and his collaborators write, and I quote, the new society, variously called information society, knowledge society, or network society, is marked by four key structural changes reshaping leadership. First, the digitalization of information and communications technology that is rapid and far-reaching. Second, accelerated globalization. Third, a shift toward knowledge as the central factor of production, in other words, from brawn to brains. And finally, more distributed, less hierarchical organizations with greatly accelerated movement within within and across organizations and sectors. In this highly dynamic environment, leadership and, and innovation and adaptability are critical. 
especially the leader's capacity to channel the right knowledge to the right people at the right time in the right place. Those of you who have degrees in library science must recognize that this last phrase is Melville Dewey's phrase for what libraries should do for people, get the right book to the right user at the least cost. <laughs> I think you will agree that these changes are not confined to the business world. Libraries are also challenged in a dramatic way to deal with the demands of our users as technology allows us to make more materials available directly to the user rather than forcing them to come to us. Accelerated globalization is a factor that has been acknowledged only in the last few years although I would have to insert that Matilda Robelstadt understood this from the very beginning. But everyone now agrees that information knows no boundaries. And the library materials that are made available digitally are critically important to people all over the world. The rapid dissemination of information is surely a big factor in the Arab Spring that we saw recently. Education for the ordinary citizen in China or India or Africa is at least a possibility because of the information resources that libraries have made available digitally. I would characterize the brains not brawn factor in library terms to be our shift from processing materials to delivering services directly to our users. Instead of preparing detailed cataloging records to enter into our own online catalogs, we are more likely to invest in services that our users really want. Specialized and individualized help when they can't find what they want in a Google search, access to more electronic journals and databases, online reference services such as real-time services when the library is closed. And in the fourth category, less hierarchical organizations, we have seen a revolution. Young librarians are no longer interested in waiting for several years, watching and waiting, before they can make a valuable contribution. They come into library positions expecting to be part of the solution immediately. Most libraries have responded in part to the demands for new professionals and in part to budgetary pressures by flattening the hierarchy. They are pairing the young, technically savvy librarians with the knowledgeable curators who know the collection so well to create new and exciting services for our users. More collections are being digitized. More faculty and students are involved in the decisions about what the library's priorities should be. For the School of Library and Information Science, it is of course essential that the curriculum for this fast-paced and ever-changing environment is geared toward preparing leaders who can help take libraries, archives, and related information organizations to their full height. In a publication called Talent 3.0, Solving the Digital Leadership Challenge, several management specialists were put together to try to identify guidelines for developing leaders for these new digital institutions that are forming all over the country. I found their guidelines so interesting that what I've done for tonight's talk is to take the 10 guidelines and apply them to librarianship. To understand the demands for digital librarianship, they conducted a comprehensive study of successful digital organizations and successful as defined in business terms. That is, they met their mission and they achieved profitability. They found 10 surprisingly consistent practices among these digital leaders, and so I am going to try to apply these to libraries, and we'll see where that takes us. So what are these successful digital organizations doing? One, they're building a comprehensive digital strategy that is shared broadly and repeatedly across the organization. 
This may be one of the biggest challenges for libraries. It is common for the library director and for a few of the managers and maybe a special unit over here somewhere to have a vision for the library's digital future. Far too often though, the other librarians in the organization continue to do their work in the belief that what they are doing are the core functions for the organization and the digital work is in addition to the core. We are no longer waiting for the digital revolution to happen. It's here. Print collections continue to have enormous scholarly value, but students are seeking digital information when they want it, on any device, from anywhere. I've just returned from an international conference in Italy where it was cold and rainy, by the way, so it's not, as, not quite as exotic as it sounds. Um, but there was a librarian there from the University of Ghent who made what I thought was an astounding statement. She began her presentation by saying, I am a humble librarian. I became humble when I saw what Google can do. And although librarians try to assure themselves by noting that Google is a commercial organization not focused on the education of students and the general public, that defense hardly holds up. In study after study of user behavior, we see that students, and now faculty as well, begin their information searches by typing words into that simple Google box. Even the name recognition of the Library of Congress doesn't help in this situation. Of searches done of the Library of Congress's website, 89% of those searches start as a Google search. So we as librarians have a lot of work to do. The ease of searching and yes, there are problems with too much information in the results. Google delivers what we librarians have always wanted to accomplish, delivering information to our users as seamlessly and as quickly as possible. It's easy. I believe that libraries must now consider how to define their services and their value in the Google environment. I believe that's our work today. So the second characteristic of these uh, digital organizations, successful digital organizations, they are embedding digital literacy across the organization. One of the primary reasons that most of the staff consider digital librarianship to be a nice add-on that is not, they're not entirely fluent in digital librarianship. They're still uncomfortable with it. For curators and subject specialists, this means knowing as much about the digital resources as they know about print books and journals. It means that they know which websites contain rich and authentic scholarly information. It means knowing how scholars use blog sites and websites to convey important research findings. Understanding where the digital resources can be found is in and of itself insufficient. Librarians need to know how to identify, identify, acquire, and preserve digital resources. It is more complicated than acquiring and storing books in our collections. Our digital acquisitions require complex intellectual property rights negotiations. Adding these materials to the library's collections will require technical know-how and a technical infrastructure that is robust enough to support digital storage and preservation. The library schools across the country are fulfilling a vital role by preparing new professionals with these skills, but those who have been working in libraries for many years may need to learn these skills. And I hope that our schools are also preparing students to be mentors 
to their older colleagues so that our students with these technical skills can actually help those who've been at work in libraries for a long time develop this digital literacy that is absolutely essential. The third characteristic, renewing focus on business fundamentals. In the print world, librarians have been concerned about proper cataloging of books and journals so that their faculty and students or members of the community, in the case of public libraries, would know what they can find in the library. In the digital environment, our users are just as likely to find digital resources through a Google search. And therefore, we need to find ways to embed digital materials into our legacy collections. By fully integrating these resources, and at the same time giving currency to our traditional mission, we see that we are fulfilling the new role of libraries. And we must be honest about the changes that are taking place. Students use the library as much or more than ever, but most students are using the library remotely. And we need to look, in terms of our business practices, at how we are investing, while we are investing in electronic resources, and students are accessing those remotely. Let me see if I've broken the equipment. Hmm. I got a little carried away with that one. Um, we have to think about how to reinvest the resources we are now spending on space, on staffing, and on organizational structure. And that requires major rethinking of what we are doing. The fourth uh, attribute, embracing the new rules of customer engagement. And this is one of my favorites. Our users, or our customers, now have control. They know how to get information. They want it when they want it. And there are lots of information resources that are freely available on the internet. So I think what we have to do is look at the perspective of the user. And how are we building our library resources to meet those needs of our users. We're not in a position to dictate what they should want. In the web environment, many user queries can be answered virtually instantaneously. If libraries are to be the information resource of choice, then libraries must be prepared to function in the web world. The fifth attribute. Understanding global differences in how people access and use the internet. In commercial organizations, we see a lot of focus on um, maximizing geographic opportunities when executing digital initiatives and building teams. But we also see these organizations developing local programs to account for differences in culture competition, and lifestyle needs. In the library world, we're not selling goods and services. Uh, we don't, uh, with the exception of, of the Library of Congress and a few other libraries, there aren't remote uh, locations for most of our libraries. But we are providing services to a vastly diverse population. And in the digital world, we have wonderful opportunities to think more deeply about how we can tailor those services to meet those differences. The sixth attribute, developing the organization's analytical skills. Over dinner tonight, uh, before this lecture, we were talking about how data has become the currency of success in a technology-driven world. 
commercial organizations will be able to extract and apply insights from data to stake out a distinctive market strategy, find the best customers, and charge them the right price, provide exceptional customer service, and create relevant marketing programs. Our challenge is different. Instead of relying on past practices, the digital leader will rely increasingly on data-driven decisions. We will develop user services based on the data we have about how they use our existing services. And when we are designing new services, we will use the information we gather from our potential users about what it is they want. The seventh attribute, focusing on the customer experience. When I was the associate librarian uh, at the Library of Congress and we were developing a new strategic plan, we decided that we would take a look at that plan from the perspective of what our users would want from us. And that took a lot of different forms. Uh, it, uh, it was a different conversation for us. But one of the things we talked about and it's just such a simple example. We realized that we were closing the library on holidays, which may be the best time for many people who don't now use the Library of Congress to come to it. And from that very simple discussion, we decided to try keeping the library open on federal holidays. So instead of um, having the Monday off, uh, we were there inviting the general public to come to see the main reading room. It's closed to the general public. It's, uh, it's for scholars. And when we began to open the main reading room to the public for special tours, it was amazing what happened. Uh, thousands of people were coming through on each of these holidays. Most of them had never been to the Library of Congress, didn't know they could come to the Library of Congress, and left inspired with the majesty of this beautiful main reading room, inspired with the ability to sit in a chair where a scholar usually sits. And we don't think about that very much, how profoundly moving that is for people who haven't had such an experience. And this simple change brought not only a lot of visitors to the library, it brought new users because a lot of people realized you know, they were working on research projects, they had a need to use the Library of Congress, so it was, a, it was just a powerful example of what can happen if you think about the user's perspective instead of our traditional, our traditional perspective. The eighth attribute, um, these organizations are developing leaders with skill sets that bridge the traditional and digital expertise. Experienced senior executives who did not grow up in a digital world must be willing to invest the time to learn about digital technologies and the opportunities they present while up-and-coming digital leaders need to broaden their experience and build classical library management capabilities. We are living in a transitional world and the effective digital library leader will be able to bridge those worlds and help the staff on both sides of the divide see the value that the other brings. The ninth attribute paying close attention to cultural fit when recruiting digital leaders. Organizational cultures that promote innovation and collaboration and minimize functional silos and focus on the customer are more likely to thrive in a digital world. Libraries are compelled to find and empower leaders who can advance digital objectives given the pace, values, intensity, structure, and decision-making processes and roles of the digital in our libraries. 
And these leaders must be willing to jolt the entrenched cultures when necessary. Ideally, the jolt would be inspirational rather than threatening, but jolt is what we need to understand the importance of digital technology in our libraries today. Digital technology gives us the tools to do what we have always wanted to do, to put information into the hands of our users immediately, and the digital leader will help all staff understand that this is the new work. And finally, the tenth attribute, understanding the motivations of top talent. The simple reality is that the best digital talent is still in short supply and in high demand. Libraries need to cultivate these leaders and make it attractive for them to stay in an organization that is trying hard to become digital. To do this, there must be a clear digital strategy for the library's development, but most of all, there must be an entrepreneurial culture that values experimentation and creativity, and a reporting structure that empowers leaders with digital skills. Too often we confuse seniority with leadership. We cannot expect the younger generation to be interested in an organization that expects everyone to learn how the elders did it. We're in a new environment, and that calls for new thinking and experimentation with new processes and new procedures. So those are the 10 guidelines. So I thought about those for a while, and I thought, well, these are really useful. I like these guidelines, but I wondered if they really are sufficient. Leadership for the library world requires many of the same talents that Elizabeth Stone and Matilda Robelstadt brought in the previous era. Intellect, a passion for the work, dedication to quality and high standards. What is different in the digital world is that the leaders are more than role models for students and faculty. They become partners with them. It is far more than an ability to use digital technology that makes a leader. Personality, of course, helps, but it's not personality alone either. Digital leaders are distinguished from non-leaders by their different combinations of skills, attitudes, knowledge, and their professional and personal experiences. Leadership must be driven by unique attitudes that are appropriate for the distributed digital age. Digital leaders must be flexible and adaptable and possess wide intellectual curiosity and a hunger for new knowledge. They must be willing to see value in sharply different perspectives and be comfortable with uncertainty. And like all leaders of all times, they must possess a real passion for what they do. They look globally for solutions and challenges and also hunger for constant learning and insist on constant learning from their collaborators and followers. They maintain a more egalitarian and results-oriented approach than earlier leaders actually needed. If Elizabeth Stone were with us today, she would have fully embraced digital technology. And if Matilda Robelstadt had been born in a different era, she too would realize that students today must live and work in a digital environment and she would insist that they do their digital work superbly, even if she didn't learn the digital technology. To be sure, there are important principles and skills that must be embraced and internalized by managers in the digital world. But there are also principles and values regarding leadership that are universal and remain with us over time. Great leaders inspire others to be the best they can be. And as I was writing this talk, I couldn't help thinking about my high school librarian, Mrs. Graves. 
She was a towering leadership figure for me. And she was certainly not connected to any kind of technology. I, I didn't even have an electric typewriter at this stage. And it was after completing elementary school in um, a three-room rural community school that I went to town for high school. This was a very big deal uh, for me. And it was there that I discovered a real school library. I hadn't seen such a thing before. Um, and best of all, there was a real librarian, Mrs. Graves. I thought she was beautiful, and I thought she had read everything. I mean, she was just one of those towering figures. She took a great interest in all of the students, and uh, she recognized in me a real starving for books. And she always had recommendations for me. She always talked to me about what I had read and what I got out of it, and shouldn't I try a little harder and read something else. Without being at all condescending, she helped me navigate the world of books and learning. She encouraged me to pursue the life of the mind, and she provided the kind of direction and assistance I needed to be successful. That is what the digital equivalent, or she was, um, I, I'm leaving out one important part here. Um, she was my advisor, she was my mentor, she was my friend, but what she did for me is help me live in a new world. And that is what the digital equivalent of Mrs. Graves, Dean Stone, and Dr. Rovelstadt will do for students, for researchers, and for people everywhere. They will fully embrace the digital world, and they will inspire students by helping them discover the best of the new resources. They will learn to provide guidance and direction and help digitally. They will be true partners in the learning enterprise. They will know what faculty and teachers are trying to help their students learn, and they will develop the resources that facilitate that learning. They will acknowledge that the library building must be reconfigured for the digital world. They will manage in such a way that the technology will be at the service of all library users. And they will be the leaders who help all of us learn to live and thrive in this new digital world. Thank you.